It's time for Talk Word, Cringeworthy Tales. And now, your host, weekly humorist, editor-in-chief, Marty Dundix. Hi, and welcome to Talk Word. I'm Marty Dundix, editor-in-chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine. And this is Talk Word, a fun little show where professionally funny people come to tell awkward and cringeworthy stories. I'm very excited about today's guest. He is a number one best-selling author on Amazon, MTV Books, and St. Martin's Press. USA Today calls his writing Laugh Out Loud, and Business Insider listed him as one of the most famous authors from Alaska. He's a former editor at Esquire at MTV News. He's written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Wired, Playboy, Discovery, Newsweek, CNET, The Daily Beast, Mental Floss. His newest book, The Time Meow Sheen, is out now, and I'm very excited to welcome an, a fellow Marty, Marty Beckerman, to the show. Hello, Marty. Welcome Thank to Thank you, Talk Marty. Word. I feel like Marty is an awkward and cringeworthy name. It's no. not a cool name. It's a great name, Marty. You got to embrace the Marty. I mean, Marty McFly. What was your experience? I think we're about the same age, right? What was your experience with being a Marty in in the eighties and early nineties? Um, I, lo- Back I, to the I, I, I loved Back to the Future. Um, Marty McFly was a great character. Michael J. Fox was a great, you know, persona of the Marty. He wasn't a he wasn't a dweeb. He he stood up for himself. He 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 got himself into a lot of trouble for not being called chicken though. I will tell ta- I See, will that, say that's that. That's the thing on the playground every day, you chicken McFly, you chicken McFly, I you know. Hey McFly, uh, you that's chicken. How they, that's how they bullied me. Even though Marty McFly was a really cool character. Yeah. You, they they you know, they could still use that to to taunt you with uh, You had to live up to it. You had to look past the chicken. You had to yeah, yeah. It's a good plus point. You, there was Marty Farty. That was another good way to bully I did. you. So I did. I got Marty Farty. Wow. Yeah. That, was a, that that just took me back. Other and Marty. We've we've lived in like a, a bizarre version of each other's lives. I think probably since <laughs> since growing up. Um, what what was the origin of you, of you being named Marty? Uh, was it a family name or it was family just... name? Yeah. Mine too. My dad's also a Marty. My grandfather's a Marty. I'm the ninth Martin in a row. Um, I'm actually, I'm a Martin with an O N. it's Hungarian. It's Marton. My okay. dad's from Budapest and I am the ninth Martin, but we all have different middle names. So I'm Martin Edward. And so it's not like a Roman numeral. There's no officialness to it. I'm not like a junior senior cause we have different middle names, but yeah, it's definitely a family name. So you're, is your, is your dad a Marty? No, my grandfather was. Grandfather um, was a Marty. Nice. But I remember one of, one of the first interviews I did when I got a published novel when I was like twenty. Uh, the writer who was kind of kind of mean to me <laughs> said, "Marty Beckerman, he's twenty years old, and yet somehow he sounds like your eighty-five year old Jewish grandfather." Yeah, it's old school. You know, we're old souls. I think Martys are. And um, yeah. the name I remember. Um, seeing the movie or researching this, the name Marty was very popular until the movie Marty debuted live on television. Remember, that was a movie I've that came out. I've never seen that one. There's a movie. I, I know there is a movie called Marty. I've seen it on, you know, uh, Netflix or whatever, but I've never actually watched it. It was, um, the movie version was Ernest Borgnine, and he just plays this absolute loser named Marty. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And the TV version of it was like this live event where uh, people all watch this. It's almost like a play. And um, they, everyone watched this play pretty much instantaneously, ruining the name Marty from mm. like 1940-something or 1950-something on. So there was this, there's like a drop-off. I researched this whole thing before because I was like, why is Marty not a popular name? What happened to us? And it's because it 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 was popular. And then after this thing happened where they... Everybody watched this thing on television where the loser was named Marty. No one wanted to name their kid Marty for like years, like decades, like a long time. It just disappeared. Like, yeah. uh, just like there's a lot of old school names you just don't hear anymore. And there's always kind of like a, a there was a point that made it not cool anymore. Have you found yourself out. going by Martin as you get older? Never, not at all. Okay. Only when I'm in trouble. If it's Martin, when I was a kid, it was, you know, Martin Edward. That was in trouble. And and when you're older, you get Martin because it's some sort of a government agency that is issuing you a letter of some sort. And you have to pay attention because uh, the inter- in, insides of this letter are important. And you better not lose it. 
And yeah. that's kind of that's kind of how that happened. You uh you you wrote your first book when you were 16 years old, which is something I learned on the internet. Um, did you what book what book was the 16 year old book? Uh, it was called Death to All Cheerleaders. Um, I was a virgin for a very long time. I think that if I had published that book now, like. I would be expelled and like everyone would think I was, I guess the word incel didn't exist back then, but they'd be very worried about me bringing like so, an automatic rifle to school. So but why that, that, was the book, what, what was the, what was the preposis of this book, Death to All Cheerleaders as a 16 year old? Because I remember being 16, uh, other Marty, and I was dating a cheerleader and I, oh, it, was yeah? fan, it was great. The, the funny thing is my school didn't even, we didn't even have sports teams. Like I was at a very small alternative hippie education school. We didn't have sports teams. We didn't have cheerleaders. I never actually hated cheerleaders. Uh, the book got its title from an article um, that was about a, a cheerleader in Texas who had threatened to kill all the other cheerleaders at her school or something oh, crazy. Okay. And I just thought that was such a snappy title for a teen angst book. Um, but I, I never actually, everyone was like, there's, oh, you must have gotten your heart broken by a cheerleader. There's red flags all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's like, you must have gotten your heart broken by a cheerleader. That never happened. I actually had a couple friends from other schools who were cheerleaders. But I guess I, I was kind of stuck with that for a few years being like, I, like I said, if that came out today, I that would be... Uh, an and incel then, red flag school was shooter your, thing. Was your fault? Was your fault? Fo was your follow up book Generation Slut? Yeah, and well, look, it, you know there can be a little, male sluts. A Let's not gender this. Let's not gender this. Um, but that was my that was my big college sex book. Uh, that one came out when I was in college, and that was um, from MTV Books. I'm I'm not sure that that title, like the first book, I'm not sure that title would be uh, published <laughs> today. They're very grabby though. They're very grabby titles. Yeah, well, you know, when you're, uh, I was going for a lot of shock factor. Comedy was very different back then. Humor was very different back then. And, you know, it was more about shock. And um, I don't even know what, what comedy is now. But, you know, I, I, the, the, I think Benjamin Franklin has some quote about um, when I'm going to completely botch this. I, it, was, like, it, was it Benjamin Franklin that said, generation slut, death, yes. to, death to cheerleaders? I think. Ben Franklin said it best. <laughs> yes. No, it was something about when you're. I'm not going to try to get it right. I'm, this is completely paraphrased. It's like, oh, when you're younger, uh, it's it's about the will is in charge, and then as you get older, the wit is in charge. Um, yeah. I feel like, especially when people are starting out in something like comedy or something just like writing, and you want to grab people's attention. Even on the, I mean, anything, any article, magazine article, uh, in, in, you know, web article, people, was, the title has to be so grabby that the the contents may not be reflective of that title at all, but it did make you read. Like, it did make you click on that article. So, I think as a college student, I mean, this is so advanced. Like, when I was, when I was in college, I was doing a cheesy radio show very similar to this one. Um, so... <laughs> You oh, were sound very, effects. you were very, I say it's a cheesy radio show. Just like, yeah. these are literally the same sound effects that I think I had when morning I was Morning zoo. At, I did a morning zoo at Syracuse. I had a, there was a student owned, operate, a student owned and operated radio station called Z89. And I did a Z morning zoo from 6 to 10 a.m. Um, as a college student. But it was like a, it was like a professionally run radio station that's, that, that, that was run by college students. But it sounded, it was a competitor to other hit music stations in the area. So while I was doing my zany morning zoo stuff, you were writing real books for MTV books. Like, how did you go? How did you do that? How did you be? A, how were you a college student writing books that were getting really printed? I mean, what college did you go to? A. I was in. And, I went to college in Washington D.C. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that back when I did my my first book in high school, the idea of a teen writer was extremely rare. I mean, there there were a couple others, but to to be um to have a book out as a teenager was was you know i mean mary shelley did it for frankenstein and it, but that was a different era you know it just really right. wasn't done now now with kendall and um wattpad you know tons of teenagers are writing and 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 that's you know that's not 
that rare of a thing for a teenager to want to publish their stories. But back then, right. I mean, just because of the mechanics of the industry, it's so hard to be um, published back then. I mean, did you you had to did, you had to submit it to like MTV Books? You yeah, had to I, I was. I, I I spent a summer in New York, and um, I was interning at a newspaper that doesn't exist anymore called the New York Press, and the editor there. I was an um, illustrator for the New York Press. Really? It's my first Small job. World. I went wow. to Syracuse for illustration. Um, and I my first my first gig I sent out you graduate, you put together your portfolio. This was still like I mean it was internet y, but nobody was looking at websites for artwork. You had to send them samples. So I had to send out like postcards with like the whole thing. And I sent out a hundred and my one definite job I got was uh, Roxy Wu, art director from the New York Press. Wow. And I did that for every week for like three years. I was their weekly illustrator for uh, an article. And was uh, that written. when John Strasba was in charge? Um, anything. I was okay. the guy that I illustrated for was called Mike Michelangelo Signolari. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so, so I, much talent out, out of that uh, that era at the New York Press. Uh, Jonathan Ames did Bort Depp. Um, I know, wrote, I know Jonathan Ames. I worked the guy on the, wrote the Departed. Um, th th there is a very long list of a uh, writing talent that came out of this very short period at that yeah at that newspaper. And it was and now yeah. you know who's always in the hot seat now is that Matt Taibbi. Guy. Yeah, Matt Taibbi got to start there. Literally, I think a little bit he later. He did. He did Cage Match. No, he was there. He was. I mean, he was there in o when I was there in o o two o three o four. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I, o two o three is when I was uh, I interned there in o two. So, um, the editor, I got John my first Strasbach. cover there. I had a cover. I did this beautiful full cover. It was such a big deal. I got to go to these best of New York parties that oh, they yeah. did an issue. It's very glamorous to be in, in puck, media and publishing. It then. The, it's not glamorous now. <laughs> it was like in the puck building in the Lower East Side, it was beautiful yeah. building. And they would have this huge party and I was just brand new to the city. And I, I had, you know, nothing going on. I had a portfolio and I was dragging it around to like Mad Magazine and Newsweek and all these places. And I loved being able to walk around the city, and there's these newspaper boxes next to the Village Voice was a green newspaper box for the New York Press, and you'd open it up, and you'd and I and my name would be on the masthead. It would say art artist contributing artist Marty Dundix, and I was like, it blew my mind. It was it it paid so poorly, but it was so it's, exciting and fulfilling. It was one of the most fulfilling things I ever to like open up and see your name right there. Yeah, on the uh, Hunter Thompson said you never get. Used to the rush of seeing your name in print. You never got used to it. It was incredible. I loved yeah. it. Um, and then, you know, they got bought and sold and bought and sold, and then they disappeared right? Uh, completely. But, yeah, it was so funny because so many fun artists, like, um, much later, I got together. I was doing TV pitches um, through Augen Blick Studios, who's a great animation studio in Dumbo in Brooklyn, and they do a ton of wonderful things for, like, and you know, um, uh, Comedy Central, and they did Ugly Americans, and they do all this. And I was putting together a show... Um, when I started my own uh, comedy company, I was working at National Lampoon for a long time. I worked for the New York Press, then I got a job at Letterman, then I got a job at National Lampoon, and then I got it, my own thing. And then we put together a show, and this guy, Mike Wartella, was also an artist for the New York Press back in the day. And then we were looking for a TV writer for this TV pitch. It was this animated comedy. And we were sending it around, we were having no luck, and we finally found. And then Wartella sent it out to his friend from the New York Press, Jonathan Ames. All because of the New York Press. It was so... I was like, are you? And then I found a copy of a paper from like oh two or three or something like that. And I looked at the, and it was it was like that issue. It was all three of us were in the same issue together, but like we didn't know each other yet. Yeah, and I, I remember um in October two thousand one, I wrote a cover story that this actually wound up becoming kind of the um, launch story for Generation Slut. It was like uh, about all the fraternity parties at my college and like you know all the crazy. Uh, stuff I was seeing, um, and the 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 illustration on the front cover was like, uh, you know, people upside down doing keg stands and uh, you know vomiting in the background. And um, now, as an adult, I think back on that, like that ran like a month after nine eleven all over New York. <laughs> and I guess I guess they want to do something more light and fun. But I I just kind of think yeah. back on that like that is. What I was really angry about in October 2001 was the frat parties. There was nothing else going on. Yeah, Jesus. it's like so many. We had to compartmentalize so much stuff just to like move forward day to day. We were just like, we're going to put this in a box and we're going to deal with it in 20 years because I can't deal with it every single day. Like right now, we have to have a distraction. So let's get really mad at, you know, college partying.
Well, I was a different point in my life. I was, I mean, I, they probably put that on the cover because they just wanted something lighter and, and you know, I remember people... because my first illustration was supposed to run um, uh, 9-11. Like, it was, it was, it was my, my, my deadline for my first illustration was tu- was Tuesday morning of 9. So I had finished up my first illustration, which was Britney Spears in a Pepsi commercial with Bob Dole get- having an erection. If that was the <sighs> illustration, okay? Uh, That's like the time period was during that commercial that had Bob Dole ha- having a... Right. He was having these ED medication things. Right. Just like, this is bonkers. So I was doing this completely tasteless illustration, and I remember being up all night the day before, and then 9-11 happened, and then... I had submitted it, and they were like, "We're going to be taking." And we're we're a little delayed with our publication mm-hmm. schedule because their offices were down there, and they closed, and they had to move to a temporary location or something. There was all this business, so it was like the, everything got pushed back a month, like a month or so, with all their publication stuff. So, God, this is such an interesting connection because it actually it works our way over to um, your big project to talk about uh, is the time meow sheen. Odd transition, though not really. If you read the book by Marty Beckerman here, this is a a, a talking cat's Y two K quest to save the world. It, and... It's behind me as well. I took down the menorahs and the wedding pictures to put the books <laughs> up. So, no. So this is uh, your new book, and it it really does put you in that t- that mental time period of two thousand for the Y two K bug. And then the events right after, which are all kinds of terrible things have happened since Y2K. And um, your book is a uh, it's a it's 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 flashback, flash forward, flashback, flash forward. When you're reading it, it's an incredibly quick book to read. It's very think- much it's very much like reading a movie, you know, like a lot of these books that are very popular fiction that are just you can tear through them because so much is happening in every chapter like a Dan Brown or like a, you know, Michael Connelly, one of those, all these books that just kind of move, move, move. Your book is very similar like that. So your writing is fantastic. Mm, okay. Other Marty, Thank you. I think. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll give the, the, this is the book that I wanted to write for so long. Uh, it was a story about um, a future earth where global warming has wrecked society and civilization. It's a post-apocalyptic thing and humanity decides they have to go back that the the critical point in history where everything went wrong was Al Gore losing the 2000 election. That if he, that if the environmentalist guy had won that election, we would be on top of uh, electric vehicles much earlier, carbon free energy much earlier, and that would have prevented the climate apocalypse. So I tried to write that story uh, for a couple years, and it just wasn't working. It was depressing. It felt like like democratic wish fulfillment, you know, just felt like all true things. Also, all all things that we have, all things that we have thought of. Sadly, I've definitely had this, like, what would have, I remember that. What, how could the world have changed dramatically if Florida hadn't had those hanging votes? Yeah. 300 votes in Florida. And I knew that I wanted the main character to have been a Ralph Nader, supporter as a teenager in Florida and that she feels this terrible guilt that she helped create this future by campaigning for Nader and she's the one who has to go back in time and fix the timeline by by getting Al Gore elected okay that's the story I wanted to write and I could not make it work again it just it it was depressing and 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 felt like political propaganda and I tried and tried, and then I had this uh, new brand of weed gummy that I hadn't tried before. And uh, as Snoop Dogg says, I don't fuck with gummies because there's no off button. <laughs> Good tip. And I'm like out of my mind, and I look at my cat across the couch, and I'm like, what if the main character's cat goes back in time? Cause she's like this brilliant inventor in the future. And once she's invented something that the cat can speak English, I don't know. It didn't make any sense, but I wrote it down in my notebook. And, um, the next morning when I had come to my senses, I'm like, huh? And immediately like 65,000 words just pour out of me. The, the novel just came together. The cat goes back in time. The cat doesn't know who Ralph Nader is. The cat doesn't know who Al Gore is, but it just, it clicked. It, I, I can't explain it. I can't explain why it worked that way. It didn't work. 
with a human going back in time to 2000 uh, from the apocalyptic climate uh, future. Uh, but, you know, uh, you go with what works. And, and uh, the time meow sheen is, is the story that came out. It is the time meow sheen. And it's about Blink the Cat. Yeah. And Originally, um, well, speaking of shocking titles, I almost went for the title with The Cat Who Stopped 9-11. Um, I was talked out of that by many people. Yeah, so, the time meow sheen it is does roll off the tongue a little bit. Yeah, it's a little than cuter. It's a little, it's a little bit cuter. cuter. We're talking about nine eleven a lot today. Yeah. Well, the yeah. the the what twenty year anniversary of the Iraq War is coming up next this week. The um, because I remember doing my cheese ball radio morning zoo uh in two thousand and the morning of after the election when we didn't have results was an odd thing because in the past we had pretty much known who had won the next day. And then this is sort of a thing where they had all the problems and all these things. We didn't really know who the president was. And I remember being like, we're reporting it kind of like, you know, jokingly like, we don't know who the president is. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Meanwhile, the rest of the world falls apart <laughs> for the next 20 years because <laughs> right. of these things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, I was really writing about the millennial experience with like, you go from that one election when we're, I wasn't even old enough to vote. If I, if I could have voted in 2000, I actually would have voted for Nader. I loved Nader and all my friends love Nader. And I was in such a, we talk about echo chambers now with social media, but I was in such an echo chamber because all my friends loved Nader. And I thought, oh, Nader is probably going to win. He only oh, got how, like 3% of the vote. How silly but in, in reality, youth. but in I my know. little social circle, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah Nader's, Nader's going to take it, take it home and we'll have president Nader. Um, but no, I mean, uh, from that one election, 300 votes when we're barely old enough to vote, uh, if old enough at all, most millennials weren't, uh, to, you know, 2001, to the Iraq war, to the recession. It just felt like a lot of, um, like a lot of downhill. And it's fun yeah. to imagine that other world. At the same time, you know, uh, we can look at some positives. Like I try to remind myself sometimes of like when I'm driving around and I'm, I activate the the voice feature on my car and say, you know, navigate here. And I'm like, I'm talking to my car. And if you told the me of 2000, he'd be talking to his car, <laughs> having a conversation with the dashboard. Um, that would be uh, mind blowing. Yeah. Um, or an echo or, you know, there are uh, we carry all the world's knowledge and porn in our pockets. Um um, let's talk about cats. Um, so, uh, so, so, uh, tell me about your cat. You're a cat person. You're a cat person. This is why your cat, a cat, is the, the 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 main character of your book. Yeah, I do. I love my uh, cat. She's what a kind of tortoise. cat do you have? She's a tortoise shell, um, like blank. I gender flipped the the cat for the book, but um, I very much based the the cat's personality in the book on my cat, uh, because um, my cat's an idiot. My cat's not a smart cat. My my wife's previous cat is, is like pinky in the brain. Like that cat, like uh, y you could drop it off three states away and it would find its way home. That cat was a genius. Um, but my 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 current cat is like the pinky part of pinky in the brain. Just there's not no, there's nothing going on behind behind the uh, the wheel. But she's very cute and very sweet. And um, so I, I wanted to create uh, for this novel a very pro a protagonist that was a very sweet and cute cat. Uh, in a very sad future, um, on a very important mission, and I think I think I think that's maybe part of why the book works is uh, I mean I hope it works is is that uh, you know you have this very very bleak dark post apocalyptic the road Walking Dead kind of future no zombies but um, but then the the protagonist is this this very naive and sweet animal. I love the well I it's fun how much you wrote the cat because the cat can talk in a per type meowington type way so the cat is talking and at first you're reading the book and you don't really know what's going on but you you know that you're reading uh what seems to be the thoughts of a cat and um the cat is the, the cat is speaking <laughs> right. with this sort of like cat accent a cax accent if you will and uh. um it was it was fun and silly and you know lighthearted and then you realize that the cat is actually talking because of something that the the collar is making the cat be able to talk and the cat has like, 
and and I I wrote this um I wrote this book a few years ago, and now there actually is a lot of research into can we use AI to understand animal language, which was in the book. The cat has a right. brain chip that translates its thoughts into uh, human language through AI through an algorithm. And now there's actually researchers looking into that, which is, uh, you know, I really explored in the book what would happen. You know, we would immediately be in a vegan. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people people would feel it horrific. I'm I'm not vegan myself, but people would feel horrific. Um, did you do research into the here. science behind making animals talk when you did when you're writing this book? A little. I mean, I did, I did some research into brain chips, into um, into. I'm never writing another time travel book again because the the. I love science fiction. I love science fiction. I love time travel stories. But once you actually start writing one and realizing with all the back and forth and there's there's a few different timelines in this and keeping everything straight, you change one little thing. You change one little thing in one timeline and realize it's the butterfly uh, effect, right? I, I don't mean I don't mean in terms of I don't mean in terms of the character changing something in the story. I mean as the author, you change one line of dialogue and then you realize that has ramifications. You know, you gotta you gotta change like twenty other things in the other timelines you're writing. It's it 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 is uh as a piece of fiction is the most difficult thing. Not not just because of trying to figure out how would a cat speak and what's going through a cat's head, but but just the the mechanics of uh, making all these timeline timelines um sync up and and be consistent but also different. Um, yeah, I I don't know that that I have a lot of you know the thing about a novel. I'm Go just going to riff it. here. the The thing about a novel is you could you could record a terrible album in like an hour, and you could you could paint a terrible painting in in thirty seconds. To to even write a terrible novel, and, and I'm not saying that's a terrible novel. That's up to the reader to decide. Even to write the worst, uh, awful novel, just to the pure amount of words it takes would take you months. And put, putting those words um, into some sort of an order that makes any sort of sense. Yeah, just to, just to get 50, 60,000 words on paper uh, is, is climbing a mountain, even if they're, even if they're, uh, even if you have no talent at all. <laughs> uh, and I don't. Uh, um, no, but uh, I, I, I think once you actually write a full, length of fiction you just have to have respect for anyone who's ever done that whether or not their book is good because it's yeah. just a commitment um, i thought this was good and i liked so your he... characters and i liked the time the uh -huh. way you were writing 2000 um and 99 it was great that you i mean you had the whole section where people were writing in aol instant messenger and i i remember i was marked yeah. on seven all capitals and I, I would have and then you'd have your away messages on on instant messenger and the way people would write, and you have pages of that to see you kind of get the, the mindset of what the what the character is going through. You can see their AOL chat history a little bit, and it it does make yeah, it, it's a good storytelling tool because it's it. I I really enjoyed those scenes in two thousand. Um, it was a fun era to revisit. Um, the more I wrote, the more I remembered, and it's so funny that Y two K nostalgia yeah. is such a thing with like people twenty years younger than us. Um, you know, they look at Kurt Cobain the way we looked at John Lennon. I mean, Kurt Cobain was, wasn't quite Y2K, he was 90s, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the early 2000s fashion is super huge now, and um, the music from that era, and, and people seem really fascinated by that sort of slightly, you know, 2000, early 2001 era, and, um, and even maybe a little bit beyond that. It was sort of... When you listen to the music of even even the a couple of the post nine eleven years like two thousand two two thousand three the music is super dirty and party heavy and it's just about getting drunk yeah. and you know, like hooking up and and it was like this kind of for how intense the news was with with the Iraq war and um it, it was kind of a crazy party time maybe people were sort of reacting to all the bleakness in the news with with uh you know um club yep. culture but um i think that maybe coming out of covid and lockdown era and and i mean obviously we went through a lot of political polarization and and i think maybe people are just in the mood for a 
um, more of a party time and are looking back to the last reel. Uh, it was really era. fun. Like up till, you know, up until t- the end, 2001, it was, you know, the worst things that were happening. It was like Bill Clinton got a blowjob in the White House and that was like the end of the world for us. It was like, that was the biggest deal. And that was it. Like that yeah. was the worst of that time period, like of things happening. Everything were, they were just like kind of, like not terrible scandals that people were just like looking for something terrible to happen, but it wasn't like really, really, really bad stuff happening yet. And then like really bad stuff happened and everything else kind of washed away. The the shark, the sharks and the sharks were eating people in Florida. There were like three people that got eaten in Florida and it was a national, that's what yeah. we're really worried about in, in, in uh, August, 2000. But I remember my Y2K, um, I had a Y2K party and um so the fact that they were doing that kind of stuff in your book was hilarious and i uh i had a y2k party and everyone thought it might oh, yeah. be that y2k might be the end of the world we thought the nuclear bombs might go off and, and planes would fall out of the sky i mean there was people were really worried about that it, and turned, it turned out, out to be nothing, nothing but uh, we definitely thankfully. thought that um at least all the computers would go to zero or something like that we thought all the dates were going to get to to zero and it was fun to read about that in your book because i was like oh i remember that Right, and I use the Y2K bug as as a plot point that that's that's how the time travel is possible. That <laughs> by by using the Y2K bug, the computer in the future is able to get back. And the, they're sort of explained. Uh, uh, they use the Y2K and bug. And they the use a Gateway travel, 2000 which, uh, computer, which I thought was wonderful too. I remember yeah, the Gateway, which uh, gave they travel back to 2000 with a Gateway 2000 they computer. They had so, these computers for um, the kids listening, and they look like cows. The computers. For some reason, looked like yeah. cows. They looked like dairy cows, and it was very cute. The kids won't and know what they we're can talking look it about. up on the Wikipedia, and they'll it, it, it existed. Yeah, it was a it was a different era. The computers looked like cows. Yeah. It was cute. People loved it, and um, yeah, I think it's uh, this is a fun book. So so how long w- this was a multi year process of putting the time meow sheen together, and uh, and now it, right. is it, did it just come out? Yeah, it just came out, um, and um, there's the cover. Uh, my friend Francisco designed the cover. I think it, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, it just came out, um, getting the word out. And I think that it's, yeah, I think the whole Al Gore parallel timeline is 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 resonating with people. You know, they kind of think I, I I'm I I we are not the only ones who've thought about that. I think I think a lot of people are age. Yeah, I think definitely think about that. This is supposed to be. A, I, you know, I know this is supposed to be a, a humor uh, 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 podcast, and I feel like I'm not being. Let's talk more about the climate apocalypse. Want to talk about anything fun? We're talking about cats. Uh, we can They're talk fun. about cats. I have a. Um, see, let's check. Let, let's test your knowledge. Let's Do you have test pets? your knowledge Do you have of cats, Marty Beckerman. Okay. I did have to do a lot of research on cats for this project. Top three cats of um, the most popular breeds. I'm going to give you three cats, and you have to tell me the number one, number two, number three cats in a row, which are the most popular. Um, The British short hair, the Persian, the Maine Coon cat, and the Ragdoll. Put those in order, number one being the most popular. The British short hair. I don't even know that it. There's, I, there's an American short hair. Just called it American short hair, Marty. Come on, I don't know nothing about cats. I would imagine the American short hair would be the most popular cat in America. Oh, big, big incorrect. Big incorrect. No. Uh, I don't know if this is for America. Oh this God. is just popular. So we're gonna look at the number. This is the oh. top ten cat breeds. Now this is a 2021, but the rag number doll one ragdoll okay. cat. Number two Maine Coon cat. Number three the exotic. Number four the Persian. Number five, the Devon wow. with Rex. The British short hair looks a lot like the grumpy cat. The companion cat is number nine. Now, I don't know anything about cats, and I didn't even know companion cat was the name of a cat. Like, it just sounds like such a sad name for a cat. Like, you don't even get a real name. You're just a companion cat, you know? Yeah. Clearly, I don't know anything about cats. I'm a fraud. <laughs> I shouldn't have written a cat novel. No, so... uh, uh there's this kind of cat research I did. I guarantee you, probably nobody in the history, no writer in the history of the world has ever tried to find an answer to this before. Um, so the cat goes back in time to when it's, you know, it's human mother. It's, I, we're not supposed to use the word cat owner anymore. Uh, it's, it's human uh, companion. Um, yeah. It's a teenager. And um, the cat first meets the teenager's mother. 
um, who it's never met in the apocalyptic future. Now, I had to look up, does the cat recognize the main character's mother by scent? Are people who are related, do they have the same smell? Because cats identify people through smell. Um, and from the research, from everything I could find, people who are related do not necessarily have, especially, uh, uh, you know, that far apart in time, would not probably not have a similar okay. odor. Um, there would not probably be genetic markers, but but because they live in the same house, the odor of the house, and it doesn't have to be a particularly smelly house because cats have very strong noses, the cat would be able to identify people who live together because they would smell the house on the one person and then smell the house on the other person. So, um, so yeah, I guarantee you no writer in the history of the world has looked up can cats identify whether people are related by how they smell if they travel in time uh, by 50 years. So there you go. Bring up. Were you always a cat person? No, I was a dog person when I was a kid. I had a Newfoundland when I was a kid um, who was, uh, I I was living in Alaska and Newfies are kind of like a, I think they're they're from Canada, Newfoundland. Uh, So they're a cold weather dog and they're, they're gigantic. I mean, I think the dog weighed 135, 140 pounds. And, um, he was a big, big friendly giant, but no, I, I actually didn't, I wasn't a cat guy at all until, um, we got, we got this cat. So, and now I'm a baby guy. I'm a dad. Congratulations. So. Is this, is this, I, I, is this I refer your first to kid? my, I refer to my fur baby. I refer to my fur baby and now my flesh baby, which, uh, my wife did not like me calling the newborn our flesh baby. Um, but, uh, you know, I got to keep them, I guess I got to keep them organized. The fur when baby and the flesh the baby. Two months ago. Well, she had the kid. She did. She did. Congratulations. I mean, you know, she did the hard part. Um, is it a boy or a girl? Yeah. Thank you. It's a girl. That's She's nice. adorable. We love her a lot. And I'll tell you, um, this is a very Los Angeles parent conversation, but uh, so every, every parent thinks their baby is cute. I mean, obviously there's no parent on earth who, who thinks they, they have a, an ugly baby, but um, I think objectively, like I show people pictures of our, our baby and they're like, oh my God, that's, that's like a perfect baby. Like that baby could be a, 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 a baby model. Okay. Um, like you could get that baby on, on the Pampers packaging. So this is a very Los Angeles parent conversation. Cause it's like, we don't, we don't necessarily want her to be an actress. Cause like child actors, you know, don't tend to turn out. They don't tend to have the best they lives. They don't always make right? that we leap don't... from child successful actor to adult successful actor, except for the kid from the Temple of Doom who just won the Oscar, right? But, but yes, there was kind that, of a yeah, gap. Good he point, did have good a gap point. between the Encino Man and getting the Oscar. Yeah, he, he turned, turned out, out great. great, but a lot of child actors like you know get involved in in, in pretty destructive. Correct. I mean, you know, it's there's a very very long list of child actors who, whose lives don't work out. Fame is a lot of pressure on a kid, so it's like. Okay, could we make the baby a baby model, but not an act, uh, not an actor? Right. You know, can can you get your baby like just famous enough to pay for college by being on? Um, well, the window know, for being a baby can, model. Can we make a new Gerber right. baby. Can can we, can our baby Correct. be the new Gerber baby, but not so famous that she's a household name and <laughs> turns into the next right. Judy Garland? Right. We want the next Gerber baby, not the next Judy. So, you know, yeah, you know just being a, a, um, a child model from the uh, ages of zero to half a year or one. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be OK. So I refer to I refer to her both as the flesh baby and as the money baby. Got to um, cash in on that. So, you know. Yeah. One of the oh, this is horrible. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a horrible man. I'm, a, I'm the world's worst. Hey, you got to figure out how to make the money no. off the off the kid. I mean, these people on Instagram. Kids are expensive. They get, she's got to start paying for herself. She's got to carry I've her weight around I've seen these kids here. on the Instagram that, you know, I, I don't know, like the parents monetize the children and they are, you know, have like billions of followers and they're sponsored by all these brands. And you're like, what's going Like, what am I doing wrong? This kid's like four and, and has like, uh, you know, life is paid for because they're they're modeling some kind of weird uh, products or whatever. But I don't, I don't know. Again, I don't think I'd want her to be famous. I don't think I'd want the world to know her. I mean, if that's what she wants, which is older, you know, that 
she'll be an adult and can make her own choices. But but you know, I I I don't want the world to know her name. I just I just want. Um, I think after you, I just I do no, after you after you have Angeles, a kid just, that has any sort of talent, you can see how some of these parents that were incredibly influential on their kids becoming like sports icons. You you, you kind of get it after maybe after you have a kid and you're realizing how much this is. You're like, oh, I can see how you know uh, Tiger Woods' his dad really wanted him to play golf or. Or or how the the yeah, Williams well, there's sisters' so many, dad I mean, really especially wanted them to here, be good at tennis. It's like, yeah, I think in L.A. there's so many failed actors and models that push that on their, you know, it's like, oh, my kid can live out the dreams yeah. that I didn't get, and that's 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 kind of sick. So you know, I mean, look, I'm not going to put too much pressure on her. You know, if she wants to be an astronaut, she could be an astronaut. If she wants to be the president, she could be the you know, uh, uh, if she, uh, 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 the uh, yeah. CEO, she could be a CEO. She can. You know, she can do whatever she wants in life, um, but, uh, but no pressure. But also, she can't be a cheerleader, and... Yeah, everyone, everyone said that to me. She's going to turn out to be a cheerleader. It's, Daddy, it's just did karma. you write this book, Generation Slut? <laughs> oh, God. I've been going to hide all my book, books. But not the newest one. She'll, she'll never even the know as a book, writer. again, is The Time Meow Sheen, A Talking Cat's Y2K Quest to Save the World, written by Marty Beckerman. Soon to be, I could see this being a streaming show on Amazon Prime. I'd watch this. You know? Um, you know, I I would I would love I am not holding my breath for that to happen. When we I, do I when we do watch out. this live um uh TV show of this cat uh time machine book, uh, uh who who is yeah. playing uh the characters, who would be the star of this of this if they were to make this? Who, who who do you see? I just have not thought about that. I haven't thought about that. I don't cast in my head really. What what, um, what fame? You, know, you don't have you don't to, have a Hollywood famous cat play... in mind to play Blink? Come on. Well, I would imagine it would be a CGI cat because because cats are uh, very difficult to get to do what you want. Not... Like in any, I mean, I know I know there are Hollywood cats too that right. can kind of sort of train. Have you ever seen the Acro no. cats? Uh, they do. It's like a cat circus where they do all these tricks and it's amazing that uh the woman who runs it as 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 uh trained them to do anything um and, and they do all these amazing tricks but 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 most cats you know you can't you they're not they're not gonna do what you want so i would they are very a uninterested cat, but I, I have not in... i do not in my head have like who would be the voice of i'll tell you know if hollywood wants to send me a check uh they can cast whoever they want is is my well, that feeling that sounds that but... sounds very possible uh marty beckerman yeah i i i never figured out I've tried screenwriting. I don't know if you tried screenwriting because it's, I can, I actually enjoy, I enjoy writing scripts, but the problem with um, going from novels to scripts is in a novel, you can do anything you can, anything you imagine you can write down right. and that's what's happening. And then in scripts, um, you have to think about budget. Like I, I, uh, my, a book I did in 2012, um, it's called nineties Island and it's about, uh, these two brothers, one works at a record store that's closing, another works at a newspaper that's closing, and they're super nostalgic for the 1990s. You can notice a theme in my writing. You love the 90s. Late um, 90s, and very happy times. They buy a private island to recreate the 90s, and, and they put it on Kickstarter, and it gets millions in donations. They start a colony to recreate the 1990s. Uh, one of the brothers goes insane and it starts like executing people who have medication created after 2000 and you know that's the plot <laughs> but um so i wrote a i wrote a screenplay version and it's like and now we have a clip from seinfeld and now we have the right. mighty body boss you're like oh, i can't use any of this stuff and, and i showed it to my friends here in the in the movie industry and and they're like okay so this script is really fun you know it would cost 375 million dollars to make right <laughs> like Intellectual property yeah. is not um, does not come cheap, so uh, that's you know when you uh, so for a CGI cat, uh, I don't know, I don't know what that costs. But, oh, they uh, just did cocaine you know, there. Maybe, I'm sure that they can do a, a time traveling cat pretty. Easily. That's true. Uh, maybe they'll do a cocaine cat. They could do next, cocaine cat, or it would be whatever a, a cat drug. Yeah. like a. It'll cat, be the um, it'll be the cocaine animal it cinematic would be like universe, a co like a catnip or, would, that would have some sort of. Uh, or, or should yeah right or should it be like shrooms, be shrooms cat, cat and like or ketamine ketamine, ketamine cat. cat works we had that yeah. on, on a weekly humorous we actually had a, a cinematic universe of cocaine bear and we had weed donkey was like the cover of the thing uh. because he was just very chill um but then i did actually 
I was some, so you got you already came up with the drug. I did, but we universe. can add some. This is a problem again. We with can Hollywood. add, There's but no, then before you know, even can. we put out ours, the guys the at the asylum that did Sharknado, they already made yeah. Meth Alligator. They made the movie. Wow. It's, it's coming out this summer. Meth Gator. Meth Gator. World. They did it in and Florida they... <laughs> because of Cocaine Bear. So, you know, and this all is happening because Al Gore didn't win, Marty. This is all, right. all of this bullshit is because of the 2000 election and your book you is... Know what? Didn't Cocaine Bear happen in the 80s? Like, wasn't there an actual Cocaine Bear in the 80s? So that was there before was a, Al Gore. Was, oh, you're, you're ruining my callback to your book, Marty. The, the time meow I'm sorry. Shit. I ruin everything. I take the joy the out of everything. Time meow Shane, a talking cat's Y2K quest to save the world, is out now, and you can buy it on Amazon. Um, and, and, and Marty Beckerman has a ton of other books you can buy. Uh, uh, also, if you want to catch up on his, his library of stuff, you can you can read all that stuff. If you want to find material to cancel me for 20 years later. Yeah, if you really want to dig deep to cancel Marty Beckerman, I don't think you got to dig very deep, but yeah. it's out there. Like, I don't even have to worry about the old <laughs> tweets. I have to worry about the uh, the old novels. Yeah, That's you don't have to worry about like 280 characters. You're like, I have to worry about 280 pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody wants to read my college sex book from 2004 <laughs> to find the ammunition to destroy my life uh don't H have i got have i got the book that all sounds wonderful everyone should go to uh is is all your information at, at your website is it marty beckerman.com they're marty and yeah just look look up on amazon the time yeah go to marty beckerman.com also we'll have a link directly to buy the book uh in the description of this video and podcast the time meow sheen um, everyone should go read uh, this talking right. cat book. Thank you. And we maybe we can start a website. Maybe we should pool our funds and buy Marty.com and we can run it I, together. I mean, I've looked that up before, and it's always just so frustrating who gets. What is Marty.com? I don't even know. What it there's is. some there's some guy who bought it in like well, we 1992. Whenever like they first let you, let you start buying domain names, because I've bought way too many domain names that I just sit on. Um, but I do not have Marty.com, and. Uh, Whoever has it, just they absolutely suck, and they're not good enough. Other Martys. It ought to be like a Marty database. I like how we brought it back to the first topic. We started off talking about the name Marty. And, We're back to and Marty. Here we are again. It all comes back. Time is a flat circle. Time is the a flat time Marty. is a flat Marty. That's very eloquently put by another Marty. Marty Beckerman, everybody. Um, well, thanks for coming on the show. This has been a lot of fun. Thank I, you so much for having me. You know, really I, I can't wait. I'm going to start brainstorming who's going to be playing um, the link in the, uh, in the book, in the cat, in the meow machine. Thanks for being on. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Talk Word. Please subscribe, follow us, and visit weeklyhumorist.com.